All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to my channel. Uh, today uh, is the 370th day that we worked on the reciprocal system of theory. And uh, this was a theory that was originated by Dewey B. Larson back in the 20th century. He died back in 1990, but not before putting out um, a dozen or so books, maybe a little bit more than that, and um, countless articles and talks and um, his um, his followers also put out a lot of work um, on his theory. Now, uh, it started way back in 1930 or so when he had uh, his first epiphanies, but uh, he worked it out kind of behind the scenes. And in 1959, he put out his two fundamental postulates about, you know, the nature of this universe. And then he took those postulates over the course of the next uh, 30 years, and he uh, deduced a theoretical universe. So if my postulates are true, then what kind of a uh, universe, what does a universe look like? And uh, then he, in his books, he basically compares his theoretical universe with the universe uh, that was measured and observed by the legacy scientists. Uh, it's amazing to, to see how Larson was able to, um, you know, delineate the basic properties of matter from strictly from his theory, strictly from theory, and he's able to more or less reproduce the scientific tables of, like, the boiling points of the different elements and the specific heat of the different elements. Strictly from theory, he didn't need a laboratory. Uh, so it's an interesting study. And uh, basically, the uh, first fundamental postulate, which is uh, the most important one of the two states that we live in a universe that is composed entirely of one thing, motion. Motion existing in three dimensions, in discrete units, and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. And that's basically, uh, that's basically it. So uh, we have a universe of motion. Motion is the relationship between space and time. Space and time are identical to each other, except that they are reciprocals of one another. They do not have any independent existence other than uh, what they get together in motion. Motion is basically a fraction with space or time as the numerator, time or space as the denominator. Space or time can exist in um, multiple dimensions, three dimensions. And uh, all our scientific quantities are relationships between space and time. And... Uh, Space and time only come in discrete units, as does motion. And if you have one unit of space in one unit of time, you have the speed of light. And the speed of light is basically the background of this universe of motion. But not only the speed of light, but the motion in all directions, outward at the speed of light. That's... Uh, what Larson calls a scalar motion. A scalar motion is a motion that has a magnitude, but it has no specific direction. 
which you could visualize using a balloon with dots on it. If you blow up the balloon, all of the dots are moving away from each other. But they're not moving in any specific direction. They're really moving in all directions. And that is the fundamental motion of this universe. And this is the motion uh, outward at the speed of light in all directions that is always occurring. And it is basically the state of rest, uh, the state of nothingness of this universe. So when we perceive absolute stillness, we are perceiving motion moving outward at the speed of light in all directions. And, uh, okay, so then he took that postulate along with the second postulate, which more or less states that the uh, universe conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative mathematics. Its primary magnitudes are absolute, and its geometry is Euclidean. Um, Larson did get quite a bit of pushback on that second postulate uh, from some of his followers especially Dr. Bruce Perrette, who we're going to be hearing from here today in just a minute. And uh, Dr. Perrette uh, prefers to use Euclidean, instead of Euclidean geometry, projective geometry. Euclidean geometry is just a subset of projective geometry. And um, he... We've gone over kind of why he, he, he does that, and it makes sense to me, and maybe to you too. If not, uh, you can go back and uh, look for um, some articles from uh, Dr. Perrette that uh, talk about the, uh, the postulates. Now... Um, also, I've done about 15 videos in the past on uh, the deduction of the deductive, uh, the, de uh, the outline of the deductive development of the reciprocal system. And that is where he takes the postulates and over the course of 165 steps, he uh, defines his, deduces and defines his theoretical universe. That I did about 11 months ago. Okay, now we are looking at an article today written by Daniel Phoenix 3, who, uh, which is a um, pseudonym of Dr. Bruce Perrette. He generally, Perrette is one of Larson's followers and one of his chief revisers. Now that uh, Larson has passed away, well, now Perrette has also passed away in uh, 2020. And, um, but not before he did, uh, made a lot of headway with the reciprocal system. Uh, he called it RS2, reciprocal system two, the re-evaluation of the reciprocal system, uh, changing, uh, updating and, um, you know, revising a little bit of what Larson has done, but I think, uh, overall an improvement and Larson, uh, was quick to, uh, say that his theory is correct, but whether he applied it correctly in all situations was a different matter. And so he was, he, uh, uh, Larson welcomed uh, new and, um, you know, insightful changes to his, um, to the details of his system. And Perrette uh, injected the system with uh, a lot of new angles, um, updated it, uh, not only the, the projective geometry, put in a lot of Taoist philosophy, Jungian psychology, uh, computer imaging, science fiction, uh, ancient history, ancient, um, uh, I guess, linguistics, and other things as well. Uh, so, uh, we are reading an article uh, from Daniel Phoenix 3, and also Daniel, uh, in this article, Daniel Phoenix 3 claims to be one of the uh, computer programmers for the Montauk Project, 
uh, which was a government top secret uh, time travel project, among other things, out on Long Island uh, in the early 1980s. And uh, it's also related to the Philadelphia experiment. If you know about that, uh, time travel experiment gone bad. And uh, this particular article is called Space Travel. Science is Fiction? Okay. Reciprocal system researchers are having a very interesting behind-the-scenes discussion on natural limits of physical systems that indicate it may not be physically possible for man to go boldly go where no man has gone before and to travel to distant worlds. Mankind may actually be trapped within the Earth-Moon system in a kind of quarantine. These conclusions came out of the natural consequences of the cross-referencing of ether research with the reciprocal system model. The basic argument is interesting. Life is a stable matter slash antimatter reaction with the body being the material half, three-dimensional space, and the soul, mind, or anima being the cosmic antimatter half, three-dimensional time. Astronauts can launch their bodies into space. But what of that silver cord that connects the body to the soul? It was well known in alchemical and magical circles that if the silver cord gets out, gets cut or stretched too far and breaks, it means the immediate death of the person that lost the connection. So one must ponder whether the soul half of the life unit travels along with the astronaut or remains attached to the temporal core of the planet, stretching only so far before it breaks, with life coming to an abrupt end. Now, this is, uh, much of this is coming out of the reciprocal system. Uh, for in the reciprocal system, life is a combination of a material and an uh, anti-material or cosmic uh, unit. Uh, now, when we say that the speed of light in all directions is the state of rest in this universe, it creates two separate sectors of the universe. One sector is moving slower than the speed of light, which Larson calls um, the material sector. And one sector is moving faster than the speed of light, which Larson calls the cosmic sector. And uh, both of them are inanimate. But when a material unit and a cosmic unit combine, normally they annihilate each other. But when they combine at the right phase, in the right phase, like at the right angle, at the correct angle, and in the correct proportions, then they create the life unit. And so the, um, you know, the body uh, would be the material half, and the soul, uh, or possibly the mind, would be the cosmic half. And so he's saying that, well, you can launch a body into space, but what about the soul? Can you launch the soul into space? Most life here has a group soul structure, which is a non-local connection analogous to a magnetic field, where one archetypal soul, the magnet, plays host to a large number of individual bodies iron filings in the field with induced magnetism. Think of a school of fish or flock of birds. Each has an independent body, but they think and move as one mind. Most of the sheeple inhabiting Earth fall into this category. 
Large groups of humans have independent bodies, but share a group soul. Of course, New Age dogma speaks of soul groups, but curiously leaves out this rather obvious connection, preferring to treat it as traveling buddies. This opens up some interesting thoughts regarding space travel. All food plants and food animals work by soul groups. So if they were removed from Earth to stock an aeroponics or hydroponics bay on Earth ship Ark, they could not survive past the length of the silver cord connecting them back to the planet. Go too far and you get a mass extinction event in your food supply. Most humans fall into the same bound by group soul category. But there are a few nonconformists that just don't fit into socially acceptable society and have individualized souls. Okay, let me just uh, see if any of his footnotes are uh, need to be read here. The silver cord in metaphysical studies and literature, also known as the Sutratma, or life thread of the Antikarana, uh, refers to a life-giving linkage from the higher self, Atma, down to the physical body. Okay. However, given the obsession with materialism and ever-dropping interest in spiritual development, uh, individuated souls have become a rare occurrence. A century ago, individuation was actually the direction mankind was headed, with the change occurring around 1925 with the discovery of the germanium triode tube by one T. Henry Moray of Salt Lake City, Utah, USA. Curiously, he was denied a patent for the device because his tube, being a solid-state transistor device, lacked a filament and hot cathode. And everybody knows a tube cannot work without a hot cathode, or at least that's what the patent office said. The harder life of the old days promoted the growth of an individual soul. If you were not being a good slave for the king of your domain, you had to learn to survive on your own. And that lack of reliance on others triggers the process of individuation. This may also explain why outcasts tend to have strong spirits. They have an individuated body and mind, providing the foundation for the spirit slash animus complex to grow on. If you are part of the collective, then it is like trying to stand upright with one foot on land and the other on the surface of water. In the astronaut situation, that would definitely result in a splashdown. The LMs, however, the LMs refer to little men, and that is um, the elves and the sprites and the um, knock and um, many of these other uh, folkloric um, fairy tale uh, creatures um, that um, Perrette uh, new and, uh, you know, claims exist. The LM, however, do not seem to have this issue because they have outgrown the group mind and have evolved the social memory complex. Think of the group mind as a many-to-one relationship between body, uh, between, uh, sorry, a many-to-one relationship many bodies with one mind that is the master. In the social memory complex, 
the relation is many to many that choose to work together in rapport. The one is the choice, not the structure. Now, you might be familiar with that term, social memory complex, either from um, the raw material, um, which was a five book set of uh, channeled work from the uh, being Ra, who is a social memory complex. Um, and um, Ra was being channeled by Carla, the uh, medium. And uh, Don Elkins was asking a lot of the questions. Don was actually a follower of the reciprocal system. And um, Ra identified this concept as a uh, social memory complex, a planet with one mind. And uh, possibly also from the hip hop group called Social Memory Complex, uh, that was my friend uh, Juan Landis. And uh, you may have heard of them too. But um, the little men, LMs, can leave the planet and explore the universe because they take their personal souls with them. Since they use natural motherships, their arcs being constructed from moons and asteroids that are supernova remnants, they have a fully functional, ready-made environment that supports both body, soul, and spirit, complete with a local temporal core, the inner sun of these portable planets. They aren't crew on these arcs. They are more like colonists, taking what they need with them, including the life support system. As such, they can travel for unlimited periods across space, particularly since there is evidence that the natural aging process stops once you leave the surface world. That is news to me. Um, I've never heard that before uh, until I read this article. So don't know that that's true, obviously, but um, I'll keep my eyes open. Many New Age sources state that the Earth is in some kind of quarantine that traps mankind here on the world, and it is the desire of the New World Order that the powers that be um, and the powers that be to break this quarantine and head out to conquer space, just like in all the old sci-fi films. What is being uncovered has led to the conclusion that this quarantine is a natural consequence of the evolution of consciousness, existing to, pre to prevent undeveloped species from getting too far from home until they learn to grow up and play together nicely. I don't know about you, but from my perspective, humanity appears to be heading in the opposite direction. Okay, um, I don't believe that we're going to get to the end of this anytime uh, in the next uh, five minutes or so. So I think we're going to stop right there and uh, finish this article tomorrow. Um, that way we can kind of take our time and go through it a little bit more carefully. And... Um, maybe go over the relevant parts of the reciprocal system a little bit more here. Perret uh, works very well in the spirit of the reciprocal system, but sometimes in his articles, he's a little bit uh, terse in explaining um, the details of the reciprocal system and how it applies to his paper, um, which, you know, it's very hard to... to uh, explain the reciprocal system, um, you know, just uh, one thing at a time. Um, you know, that's why he calls it the reciprocal system. It's a system of theory. So it's a, f a fully, you know, holistic system. And uh, that's why it's a tough study 
uh, working on the reciprocal system because you really need to have read more than one of Larson's books. You need to have, you know, read several of his books before you start to fill in the fill in the blanks and and to get the bigger picture. Um, if you just read, you know, a little of his stuff, then you're left wondering, like, where is he getting this from? Like, it seems like this is just kind of popping out of nowhere, or he's just making this up, or, you know, this is just, um, he's just hypothesizing this because it fits in with his theory. But then when you see that he uses the exact same, uh, you know, process uh, to work in the field of economics that he does to work in the field of atomic physics and he does to work in the field of astronomy, then you're kind of like, huh, well, maybe this is kind of a system that he's dealing with um, and that there's more to it than what I really just know about. I need to kind of really see how he, that he's applying it the same way and he's coming up with answers in like every field. So, um, you know, that's my advice as far as the reciprocal system is concerned is just, you gotta just, um, um, trust a little bit, you know, you can't reject things out of hand just because it sounds unfamiliar or, or exotic. Um, you know, just take it in, you know, I'm not exact, I'm not asking you to accept it. Um, I'm just ex answer, asking you to take it in and, and, and let your subconscious work on it a little bit, let your, you know, sleep on it. And, you know, eventually you, you know, once you are able to have the whole picture presented to you, then you can kind of judge it and grade it and decide whether it makes sense to you. But you're really not able to, to decide whether it makes sense to you until you've, until, it's, until you've given it a full hearing. And you don't really get a full hearing of it until you've looked at, you know, kind of several applications of it. Um, okay. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. We'll be back to finish this article tomorrow. And I uh, hope you join us.